Now, I've talked a lot on this channel about world building and about how I like to make world building an integral, kind of fundamental part of every single game I play. Now, in Ironsworn and Ironsworn Starforged, world building is handled very elegantly with an exercise that takes place during the campaign setup called Choose Your Truths. Now, in both Ironsworn and Ironsworn Starforged, the settings are assumed. In the former, it's the Ironlands, and in the latter, it's the Forge. Now, because the settings are already there, it doesn't mean that the world is fleshed out at all. There aren't reams and reams of, of lore and stuff that's already built into the world written in the rulebook. During campaign setup, you work through the truths exercise, determining what is true about your version of the world that you are playing in. And this is done before character creation, so so much of this will inform and kind of flesh out what kind of characters you're going to be playing. The exercise is pretty straightforward. You'll be given a topic or a theme and you'll be presented with three statements about that. So it might be religion or monsters or communication or medicine. And the three statements are ones you'll look at and then between you players or by yourself, pick which one is most true about your world. And the great thing here is that you don't have to pick any of the three that are provided. You can edit them and you can also come up with your own completely. But just picking one of the three that comes written in the book gives you an awful lot to go with. There is some specificity there that will give plot hooks and ideas and drive the story. And there is enough blank space for you to fill in yourself to find out what happens whilst you play. Now you can watch me do a slightly abridged version of the Truths exercise in my Session Zero for the current Starforge campaign I'm playing right now, but I thought it would be interesting to watch it take place in near enough real time. So I asked my good friend Sketchy, who is an amazing illustrator and content creator in her own right, if she would like to do the Truths exercise for a hypothetical campaign and what we came up with was so fun and let's just say that I am kind of desperate to play around in that world now because uh, there's an awful lot going on in there. So without further ado, I will pass over to me in the past because we recorded this about three months ago and uh, we'll take you through it. So we're just going to jump right in and um, the, I suppose the best way to start is um, the first of the 14 truths, which is the cataclysm. So there's three options, as with all of these, um, and they are uh, the sun plague extinguished the stars in our home galaxy, interdimensional entities invaded our reality, or we escaped the ravages of catastrophic war. Now, each one of these options... Um, as you'll see on screen, has has more to it. Um, but those are the kind of like the three flavours. Um, are you feeling any particular pull to any of these three, Sketchy? Starting at the end of it all. Um, funny thing is, this was always the hardest one for me because mm, same. in my head, my characters never revisit this problem. Right. But... I've seen on bad spot that it has made the biggest difference to go back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. But so since I have no idea and I'd rather not think too hard on it and just jump in and get some ideas, I'm gonna try some dice first. Mm. And I just got my little little janglies here. I, uh, I have twenty seven. So, 27 is the sun plague extinguished the stars in our home galaxy. Um, so, you can, like, all of these options are numbered, um, like Sketchy has just demonstrated, um, and you can roll randomly on the bad spot. Um, I did all of mine randomly, I think. Um, I think I might have chosen one or two, but the rest of them I just rolled because I was just like, well, you know, we'll just see what comes up. And, and luckily, um, what does come up, will always give you something, right? And it also helps if you already have an idea for a uh, a setting. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people love Star Wars. It's got all the lore for you, but if you want to start from the ground up like crazy people like us, uh, roll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, on ours, it says, uh, the anomaly traveled at incredible speeds, many times faster than light itself, and snuffed out the stars around us before we realized it was coming. Few of us survived as we made our way to this new galaxy. Here in the forge, the stars are still aflame and we cling to their warmth like weary travellers huddled around a fire. Um, and then we've got another option, uh, which basically is 
is trying to figure out what the sun plague is caused by. Now, I don't know if that's going to be relevant for us, um, but should we should we pick one or roll for one of these? Um, I'm going to, I think for this one, I might uh, just choose. Okay. Because uh, I think there's a saying of we, what was it, from Jurassic Park about we focused on if we could and not if we should. Oh, yeah. And so that's going with the scientific experiment gone awry. Oh, that's cool. Because I'm pretty sure one day we're going to try to harvest the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so essentially the the end result of this cataclysm truth is that our old galaxy uh, become became uninhabitable because of a scientific experiment got wrong, which um, caused a sun plague. So that's where we're at. That might not be anything in our story that we're telling now, but it could be. I can already say what we're gonna say. What happened in this game is that technology was not lost when we left. Uh, yeah, they're gonna try it again. I I think that that <laughs> is um, that's a really interesting thing to to begin with because when it comes to like factions in this game, if you've got some factions who were people who supported the scientific experiment back in the old galaxy or people who were against it, it instantly just this one choice has already got our kind of creative juices flowing. And that's why we're doing this. Um, what's our next truth, Sketchy? Our next truth would be Exodus. I've got mine up over here. And my favorite one to do is a ragtag fleet of ships. It's just the grungy look is always my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me think about Fallout, yeah. but just throw us in. The, or at this point, anyone can say Starfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it goes on to say that um, we have experimental FTL drives carried our ancestors to the forge, but the technology that powered the ships is said to be the source of the sundering effect. Uh, a fracturing of reality that plagues us here today so that's cool because it means that we've escaped a plague of sorts a sun plague that, that rendered our old galaxy uninhabitable and now we've got a new one um the the extra detail there says um the experimental drives used by the exodus fleet are forbidden but the damage is done the sundering spreads across our reality like cracks on the surface of an icy pond those fissures unleash even more perilous realities upon our own did we flee one cataclysm only to inadvertently create another i think that those two that we've come up with so far they really go kind of hand in hand don't we we have got a very scientifically irresponsible like culture here Yes, that kind of drives all the rest of them, it almost feels like. But I think there can be some deviation, obviously. The next one is communities. Now, we've already established that we've got kind of like a science facing community um, or, you know, a, a culture and a, and a world that's driven by the pursuit of science just from our first two truths. Um, so what do you think out of these three? um would make a good fit because i think there's one already the last one which says we have made our mark in this galaxy but the energy storms we call bale fires threaten to undo that progress leaving our communities isolated and vulnerable i think if we went for that it would be maybe too much going on because we've already got this sundering yeah. that's in this world and we've already left a plague so i think perhaps um getting rid of that one would probably be a good idea so I think it makes sense that if a ragtag fleet of, of ships came through from the old galaxy into this one, um, then the second choice here, which is um, dangers abound, but there is safety in numbers. Many ships and settlements are united under the banner of one of the founder clans. I think I like that. That fits really nicely. What do you think? That fits actually. I was actually leaning on that one because that would mean like maybe each clan is focused on a different field of science. Oh, um, and Oof, like they're that. all in a race oh. of building the best of something in their particular focus. So uh, when I saw that, I said, no, that's perfect. Yeah. And uh, what if, um, what if of all the factions there are, um, there is like a kind of a splinter faction who might just be the best, the most brilliant. And what if they are trying to harness the sundering, which is this, um, this this crazy kind of like fissure in space and time that's in the new galaxy. What if they're trying to harness the power of that to get back to the old galaxy? Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That's cool, right? Oh, space time. Oh my gosh. I mean, All right, I'm way know, too excited. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> like, 
but who and but who that what a fun thing to try and find out like what what is this small kind of like hyper elite bunch of scientists doing this crazy experimental stuff what are they trying to do and why um yeah that's really interesting i'm down for that yeah um it says further in the information, we have a tentative foothold in this galaxy. Each of the five founder clans honor the name and legacy of a leader who guided their people in the chaotic time after the Exodus. Vast reaches of the settled domains are claimed by the clans and territorial skirmishes are common. I wonder if one of the founder clans is um, people who, the people who want to get back. They never wanted to leave in the first place. And I wonder if they're like these kind of like loyalists to the old galaxy. And even though it's this galaxy that's uninhabitable, there's a reason they want to go back. Maybe the thing that rent that made the um, the experiment that went wrong. They they think that maybe they could do it right this time. Yeah, I can see like even making um, a an artificial sun um, to even start rebuilding. They might have uh, stumbled across the technology or think they have. And that's why they want to go back because at this point they've abandoned reason. Oh my gosh, I'm getting too caught up in it. Oh, it's good though. It's good though. Here's a question though, um, Sketch. What's the? Have you got any thoughts about? Because because this this exercise comes in the campaign creation before you come up with a character, and it's supposed to maybe try and inform what kind of character you want to play in this world that you're building. Any initial thoughts from you? Do you think the uh, of a kind of character you want to play? It's okay if you don't. Um, I've kind of got nothing currently i like to build characters that can automatically uh get their hands involved with the main theme yeah so um a character that definitely has some scientific qualities just because this seems to be just a main theme and this is going to be a big problem and you, this will keep you constantly moving of course you don't want to burn yourself out on a single thing mm -hmm. but you figure this is something that'll keep returning here and there I, I wonder if because science is a big theme but we don't want to be bogged down in science of a theme I wonder if an interesting thing to explore is a character who is like the opposite who is a janitor <laughs> I, I was thinking more along the lines of um uh, like when we get to the truth about religion, that makes that truth really interesting. Oh, so, so, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, what if we had someone who you know is a is a is who thinks you know science is heretical and like uh, all of this technology that's being developed is 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 the devil's work and that's what's driving them. That I mean, let's again let's not get too caught up. Yeah, we we're just in like the third one and we're lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are forming a very interesting world. Um, so. Uh, what's next on the list? Um, it is iron. And I would say with all my heart, Sean has he put a perfect balance with always the second option. Like, I think it's always the most popular one and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to fight it and I'm going to roll instead. And if it goes there, then he knew what he was doing. Fate decided. <laughs> what, what can you say? All right. 53. A 53 is the oh, one. <laughs> Um, I've always loved this one just because it just, in my head, it made iron magical. And I knew once we got near magic, it existed. And that's like, I don't know. I've just kind of pre-decided that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same. Like this, this is the, the central kind of tenet of, of the bad spot campaign. Like, you know, black iron gates and, and, and kind of like, uh, opening mystical doorways through space and time. Um, but here's a question, though. If we, if we uh, have decided that we're characters who are living or operating in in a in a in a society in a culture that is deeply scientific, where does magical metal come into it, or is that something that is perhaps the the kind of specialty of one of the founder clans? Like one of the founder clans a kind of almost this alchemistic kind of clan who were uh, always who maybe who used these remnants of these these fragments of this mysterious metal and of, of, of trying to use it to do like really powerful things but they aren't quite trusted by some of the other clans but the other clans know it's powerful perhaps and it's like a contested resource black iron being it's kind of a rare material but it's but a, a particular clan having a monopoly there we go yeah on black iron but there's only maybe 
certain people who use it correctly. This was always another weird part I had about Iron Sworn Star Forge was how do you determine yourself an Iron Sworn? Is that just an unspoken thing? Mm. I know it's kind of person by person, but um, I can imagine there's certain people that know how to use it maybe innately and they're trying to figure out maybe a more scientific way to use the black iron. Yeah, I, I wonder, right, because this is the thing. If we say that, like, you know, vowels are sworn upon this this black iron, and but black iron is incredibly rare, then being iron sworn becomes very important, right? So either right. Our, our characters are really important because we're iron sworn, or there's, like, fake black iron. Uh, you know, like, fool, you know, like fool's gold. Right, so, so, yes. So what if there is, like, this schism, which is there are there are true Iron Sworn who have black iron, and they swear upon it, right? And then there is the people who claim to be Iron Sworn with this black iron, which is kind of indistinguishable to, like, actual black iron. And there's this kind of balance between the real Iron no. Sworn and the not. And getting to call them out in the middle of your game if you're in the middle of thinking about you know i just want to it can be ca cathartic to <laughs> uh think about finding fake iron sworn and getting to call them out and yeah no this is awesome uh being the iron sworn and just and being able to see like maybe you think you see one at a point in time and then you realize no this this guy isn't actually the thing and you have this big moment probably in a strong hit or even a match that um, you actually end up being the answer to the problem. But what were you going to say? I, I was going to say, I mean, I think that's amazing. I think that's a really, really interesting um, thing you've just come up with there. A really interesting kind of dynamic that could happen whenever there are multiple Iron Sworn people in the same place. Um, but I wonder if if Black Iron, the, the fake Black Iron is so indistinguishable from the real stuff that even the Iron Swan don't know who's really Iron Swan. <laughs> and there's maybe, <laughs> maybe there's uh, like Iron Smiths or something that can, they, they're they the only people who can tell. But like, that's kind of cool, right? I think that's... Yeah, it is. That's something that, that could be really interesting because, I, I mean, what if the two of our characters, let's just say, partners in crime or whatever we end up doing, like one of us is really Iron Swan and the other one isn't? But we both, oh, and we, you find out when you go to the Ironsmith. Yeah, but we both think we are. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome, actually. That would be a, it's a pivotal moment in a story to yeah. get to that realization that, like, hold on, one of us really isn't real. Yeah, but the thing is, is I, I wonder whether, and this is a really interesting idea. I'm, I, I'm super, in, I'm super invested in this world already. But like, what if our characters? You know, we we spend you know years doing a campaign, right? And in the in that campaign, we 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 perform deeds worthy of Iron Sworn, right? And then we realize that one of us is and one of us isn't. How interesting is that dramatically to be like, well, is being Iron Sworn having the genuine iron, or is Iron Sworn is being Iron Sworn the the power of the deeds that you've done in this galaxy? That that to me is a very dramatically interesting idea. Yes, because that that really changes how you look at it. Like it's not the thing that makes me iron sworn. Yeah, exactly. It's the acts I do, and ooh, I'm invested in this story. Like if that's true, and the uh, and that and that's what the truth exercise is. It's what is true about your world. If it's true that there is, you know, to be worthy, you are iron sworn because you have this incredibly rare metal totem. But then also a lot of people have what they claim to be this real rare metal totem. Then science then becomes the thing that makes, you know, makes those decisions. It, the science becomes the thing that, that, that actually determines the value of those two things, which is, I think, a very, very fascinating idea. But again, we're getting mired down in details here, even though this is very cool. Yes. To be honest, I could do this all day. I could just set up campaigns all day and just make kind of like fun <laughs> stories without actually having to play Long story short, this shows you can edit uh, one of the truths. Mm -hmm. It says one thing, but in our world, there's real black iron, and then there's a black iron that seems so true uh, it can be mistaken, yep. but it's not it. 
there you go. Yeah, that is it. So yeah, like Sketchy says, you can edit these you want, or you can make up your own. And I think that we've just shown there we've 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 established from what it says that iron vowels are sworn upon totems crafted from the enigmatic metal we call black iron. But what we've added there is that there is this kind of like yeah pretend kind of fugazi type uh, type black line and i love that idea very much um right so this is interesting so we we've we've established a, a society and culture driven by science um with this enormous respect for this 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 kind of very rare powerful metal um which they know is black iron but there is also fake black iron out there so in terms of the law which is our next truth um i wonder what's going to fit best so the first one and this is the one that i kind of always go for just because i, I like the firefly slash star wars kind of like wild west theme is the first one which is like much of the settled domains are a lawless frontier criminal factions and corrupt leaders often hold sway i always pick that because it's cool and i think that if you go to places where you can't be um assured that you'll be protected legally or that you you know that, that everything is just kind of like frontier town it makes it more interesting in my head but like i wonder if mm -hmm. like moving away from that because if we've we've established that like science and and technology is important in this society then it, it seems weird that there would be so much kind of lawless space and i think that i wonder whether it's a it's a priority to these this civilization when they settle a new um planet or whatever that they they kind of rigidly put these structures in place to continue the scientific or scientific work so a do you think that's true and b if that is true which of the other truths do you think fits it or do you think that just a, a wild west type uh, lawless frontier is just more fun i can literally argue the point for any one of these mm -hmm. um and and the idea that in lawlessness because you're in a completely new place there's no rules here except for the ones you make yeah. and if you don't want anything to get in the way of science then you don't make rules to stop it mm -hmm. uh morals is based off of who makes the rules right yeah um and then in the second option um you can of course kind of have rules but you hire other people to do your dirty work for you mm -hmm. or bounty hunters are the only thing that you have to worry about but and then the final one makes the most sense in a science-based society mm -hmm. where it's about order and structure and that fits in it. And that's where I would think this is another dice situation because I can argue the point for any one of these. I think the second one is probably the hardest one for me to argue the point for. I, I agree. And I, I actually think that three makes a lot of sense because if we read three, uh, the third option, sorry. It says, our communities are bound under the terms of the covenant, a charter established after the exodus. The organization called the Keepers is sworn to uphold these laws. The idea that they're called Keepers, I wonder if they're like kind of Keepers of the law, but also Keepers of like knowledge. Um, so they're almost like these kind of librarian or kind of like chaplain type figures who um, are kind of enforce the laws of the land and, and you know you kind of like keep order and mm -hmm. stuff like that but they also are responsible preserving knowledge and maybe they kind of are based in these like archives or these like laboratories or something um i don't know what they'd be called but like they're they're like important people um yes and i think that's kind of interesting i i honestly don't think i th i think you're right i think it's either the first or the third one i think it's either lawless and if we go that way, it suggests that the society we live in is quite kind of um, insular and that, you know, there's probably these pockets of like really well-maintained, well-settled, kind of like technologically advanced society. And then on the outside of that, there's just like nothing and there's no law, there's no protections, which again is actually really interesting. Oh, it's tough as right? it? <laughs> I think that um, we kind of set it together. It, we wanted to be the first one. Like it might be your normal go-to, but there's so much potential and lawlessness. Yeah. Um, and I will I'll admit that when it comes to uh, law and structure for me and setting up worlds, mm -hmm. that's the hardest bit for me because it, it can get so nuanced. Yeah. I mean, 
you already see like how the government looks on how many different tiers of things you have to look at to figure out how to get something done. Yeah. And once you go into world building with that, it, it can get as it can get deep. Yeah. So lawlessness is just like Ed, throw that out the window. This guy over here has control of it over there. I mean, maybe John still has control. He might be dead today. I don't know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> maybe John has control. Maybe he's dead today. I don't know. I think that's it. That is that is a one quote from this episode so far. I love that so much. Um I, I I really am starting to I was very much leaning towards the last option, but I think you've talked me around. I think it's really interesting actually if we can say that in in our world and in our society that there are these 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 kind of settlements that are like very uh, technologically advanced, but anyone outside those you're on your own and like that's you know there's power vacuums all over that are being exploited i wonder then here's a question if we have a sign scientifically advanced society with you know technologically advanced and all that stuff and but outside of those is um a kind of a lawless frontier are the scientifically advanced societies in some way enclosed like are they like dome settlements and if you're outside of the room, um, you're basically in trouble. It's, it it kind of makes the borders absolutely clear when it's it's in these kind of enclosures. But it makes the borders clear, and if you're out, then you're free game, and it can be used in uh, conflicts or you know these high stake situations where they're purposely trying to drive you outside of their borders so they can deal with you the way they want to. Oh, that's good. That is very good. So maybe not enclosed like domes, but definitely there is a hard border between, you know, the law, structure, science, technology, safety, and you're on your own, right? That's what we've established. Yeah. Yeah. I love that so much. Very good. And I, th I feel like this, uh, that there, you know, we've spent five minutes talking about this one thing. And, you know, we've gone back and forwards through like three options and mutually come up with something that's interesting, which is based on the prompt and also keeping in the theme of what we've come up with so far. Uh, yeah, it just goes to show how good an exercise this is. It's an awesome exercise. Um, it, I've used it for almost every new game I've played. I've tried to think of categories like this mm -hmm. and and try to simplify just down to like, maybe a single sentence or a couple of sentences so that I can get a general idea of what I'm playing in and just keep running from there. And this is kind of my guideline of or my touchstone for, okay, this is keeping the lore consistent. So it, it's a brilliant exercise. Yeah. Cool. So the next one is really interesting because uh, it's religion. Um, I always go for, in all of my games, the, pretty much the one that says it's a godless place. <laughs> and I don't know whether that just means that, like, that reflects how I feel about, you know, not wanting to get bogged down in, like, gods and deities and religions and stuff in, in my games, um, mainly because it's too much to keep hold of. But then, weirdly, in the bad spot, we've, <laughs> we've gone on to have these kind of two weird religious orders that I've kind of established uh, almost by accident. Um but like, what, what what kind of jumps out at you in in a, in a society and a culture that is dominated by science and technology and the pursuit of kind of like scientific truth? Which of these is is the most interesting? Is it the obvious one that to say that in our society there is no god because there is only science, or is it even more interesting to say, oh my god, there's there's uh, there's religion as well? Um, my mom said I should have been a lawyer because I can argue anything, <laughs> um, <laughs> and. I, I, I yet again can say that it could just be as easily as one or three for me. Mm -hmm. One makes sense of just everything is science. So how can there be this mystical entity if science dictates everything? Mm -hmm. And then in the final one, you worship science so much that you've constructed this idea that there is a godlike entity that provides knowledge and truth but no gods makes just as much sense. So, like again, that's why I'm terrible at this. It can go either way for me. <laughs> should I? Should I tell you? I, I think we should pick um, no no god, the the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that I think that is because I think that for some of these truths, you just have to pick one and move on. Uh, and yeah. I, I think I think you know we could spend 
you know, this whole exercise getting deep into every single one. But there's always, a, you know, not all of these will come up in our story. And I feel like if we're leaning yeah. so heavily on science technology then it's really super easy to say um our gods failed us we left them behind um because the thing is is that does leave the door open because even just reading the description of that truth it says the exodus was a tipping point which makes total sense for for, for you know for our, our culture and our society the gods offered no help to the billions who died in the cataclysm and spirituality has little meaning in the forge most now see religion as a useless relic of our past but the search for meaning continues and many are all too willing to follow a charismatic leader who claims to offer a better way so the door is still open um yep. to have some something with a kind of like a religious or like theological bent to it especially if we're talking about you know these these settlements that have hard borders between like law order science technology to like maybe you know the the badlands this wilderness this lawless frontier that's the exactly the kind of place that you know a couple of iron sworn might run into like you know a charismatic cult leader who is you know you know trying to you know sway his faithful to to kind of do something you know kind of nefarious and i think that's super interesting um honestly yeah yeah i wonder whether it would be really fascinating for you know going back to talking about our characters if this is the case I really like the idea, and this this is I think maybe this says a lot about the kind of characters I normally play in my games. I wonder if my character might be a character of faith, like a character driven by faith and devotion in this world that tells him like that that it can't be true, right? And that that's really mm -hmm. interesting, especially if we're gonna talk about this whole kind of like real black iron, fake black iron idea that like, uh, how would his, how would his faith be shaken if he found out he wasn't a real iron sworn, or how would his faith be confirmed if he found out he was? And I think that's really interesting. So I think I'm already. Um, I don't really know. I think there's a there's an asset I think called like devotant or something. Um, in the, yeah. In the, maybe that might be something to to move on but that's that's kind of that's the little seed that's been planted in my head that whatever character i'm going to play in this game there's an element of faith to the character whether you know they are having a crisis of faith all through the thing or whether they they're kind of so resolute in their faith that they they kind of think they know the way i think that's being a really interesting thing to drive a character through this world um, I mean, thinking about you having a religious character, and I said I want to start off science, I think that's the most interesting duo in a world that leans more on like my character side, and I'm trying to constantly convince you, like, this is kind of funny, but I can see your point for sticking just with the easy, our gods failed us, because as you said, um, the door is still open. There's nothing in here that says other things aren't possible. It just says that the main driving point is we feel like that there's no gods and don't worry about it. Yeah. 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 I like that. Uh, what's our next one? Uh, so this is so not fair because now I'm thinking about, I have a scientific character. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try a role for here. Um, although saying magic does not exist seems just as fun. Uh, fun. So I, all I have is the same roles for everything. Mm -hmm. I think my dice are broke. Uh, what so you... 57 and it kind of makes sense with one of the factions being focused on um uh, bioengineering mm. yeah that's really cool that's really cool so that's um so yeah there's um it says the middle option is uh, supernatural powers are wielded by those rare people we, we call paragons. Um, and then it says, while not magic in the truest sense, the abilities of the paragons are as close to magic as we can conjure. And these powers are born of, and then there's options. And you were drawn straight to genetic engineering, right? Um, yes, just because of, uh, again, our theme here. And to have that a faction that's focused on that mm. alone. And... Um, they pay the way for anything you might want to do. If you want that, then, I mean, they're the monopoly on it as well. Yeah. I really like the idea that you said, like, as soon as you said the word monopoly, I was like, each of these factions has their own thing and the other factions just can't take them out because they are the people who know how to do the thing that everyone needs. Basically, what you've got is these, these, these like kind of factions that have been splintered and 
and these deep divisions between them and these like you know historical wars that have been fought between them and or whatnot and you know there's all these rifts that need to be healed they all need each other because they've all got the answer collectively but they don't know enough about each other's thing to like just sort mm-hmm. of like go in and take over it and i think that's really interesting like a bunch of factions who who genuinely can't fight each other to the death because maybe the death of the faction is the death of the the knowledge i can see that how every single fa- um every single faction they contribute something enormous to every society but in a sense they block each other from learning about what the other can do in order to maintain their own power Mm -hmm. so if you destroy one you might mess up medical technology um or if you hurt another one well then the one that does black iron well the ships that we build that can go through atmospheres and handle ftl well they manage that Mm -hmm. so we lose all society if we hurt one but you also want to dominate each other yeah that's really interesting right Yes. Yeah. So, yes, it is. <laughs> so, so the next, the next truth is is one that I got really hung up on in my game, and have mentioned it in the first episode, and then literally never mentioned it since. Um, the next one is uh, communication and data, and it basically talks about how quickly you can move, you know, you know, messages and data and and communications through the forge. Now, Uh, One of the options, which is the one I was drawn to in my game, is the middle one, which it says information is life and we rely on space-borne couriers to transport messages and data across the vast distances between settlements. And I started with that, which basically had, you know, and tried to make out that these couriers are really important. Had a courier in the first episode, never mentioned it since. Never (laughs) never even brought up any kind of uh, communication at all that isn't just like two people in a room talking to each other. But I think for our purposes the the third option here which is um in settled domains a network of data hubs called the weave allow near instantaneous communication and data sharing between ships and outposts so basically saying the most technological technologically advanced option i think we kind of almost have to go with that because you can't have that um that uh that society that we're coming up with that, that can't openly communicate, that can't share quickly. Mm-hmm. But that's not to say we have to go with it word for word. Like this, we could still feed in the fact that there are kind of entrusted information brokers or like people who transport things that need, that can't be like securely communicated across space, maybe. I don't know, how do you feel about this one? Sorry, there's always, there's always one truth in here that I never really care about. Um, <laughs> and it's a, a, in Star Forge, I don't know why, it's just always been this communication one. I think it's because it, it, it seems to me like a, a detail that I can't make interesting. I think it's my failing, not, you know, the truth. <laughs> it's just me. That I, I don't think I can make it interesting. Um, I think the third option is the sweet spot, because as, you, um, as we know, the speed of information is the speed of development in society. Yeah. Um, the faster we can tell i mean here i am you are all the way over there and i'm all the way over here and we're having an instantaneous conversation yep and so that's definitely like a given like it has to happen can i argue the other ones yes i've already established that i can do that (laughs) um but i definitely can see that there are some times where they send uh information in a more secure fashion going back to what i was mentioning before that they don't like to share information with each other in order to maintain their individual power. Mm. Um, if there is some incredible new idea, concept, plans, blueprints, you don't want that to possibly be intercepted knowing that you're always trying to infiltrate each other. So oh. I think that the weave uh, is is definitely a big one and it's kind of got a splash of number two. Um well, I think what you've just said there has is, is given me an idea. I wonder if this is interesting, right? Imagine if the weave allows everyone to communicate, but the factions hate each other so much that they will only communicate with each other through couriers. Oh, I love that like, one. <laughs> imagine existing now, but the only way you'll talk to your enemy is by sending him a telegram. <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? 
I think that's I think that's kind of interesting that like you know there's there's this kind of pomp and ceremony to like when one faction speaks to the other they'll send this courier and it's like maybe this is quite a prestigious job but they know that you know that message will take like weeks to arrive <laughs> like you can just talk to your friend on another planet like instantaneously I, I, for some reason i think that's funny but then also quite interesting and kind of um it says a lot about how distrustful the factions are, they are. of each other I, so i think that's good i think that's good we'll go with three with a, a smattering of two i think that's good the next one is i think it's medicine isn't it um so yeah to basically kind of work out how advanced medicine is again are we saying that because we live in a technologically advanced society then medicine is advanced or is it is medicine thing that one thing that's kind of dominated by one of the clans um let's see so far we have one of black iron or just of kind of I don't know what to call that one, engineering, yeah. uh, architecture. And then we have another one that's bioengineering. Mm -hmm. um, so medicine makes sense to have a monopoly on because definitely, if you, as it was mentioned before, if it falls, then the, all the many new diseases and illnesses that exist in an alien galaxy or would... Yeah, that's kind of important. <laughs> yeah, and I think <laughs> to dominate on that one. It's 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 interesting, isn't it? That like if each each of these factions controls one of the main resources or one of the main technologies in the forge, it just makes them so powerful, but then also so dependent on the others, which is really interesting. So I, I think that again, it might be a smattering of of two and three here. So two, mm -hmm. two being um, the idea that there's these technicians called riggers, which create basic organ and limb replacements. And then, sorry, in the, in the last truth, there is orders of sworn healers preserve our medical knowledge and train new generations of caregivers. I think that probably most people make do with a, like a back alley surgeon who will give them a, an arm that's been grown on the back of a rat or whatever. Um, <laughs> Because, you know what I mean? They're like, you know, they, they, you know, it's real kind of like, you know, the frontier science, like field medicine, basic stuff. But the clan that controls most of the medicine is, you know, is really high tech stuff. I, I wonder if that faction, the, the like the medicine faction, as it were, I wonder if they're the ones that are like the people who work for it because of their conscience, maybe they are always kind of like leaking or or like defecting to other factions to you know they, they might see on a in a settlement or a planet some some community or or some mm -hmm. civilization that needs medicine and you know because of like you know the the hippocratic oath or whatever is that what it's called because of that that they've sworn or their their space equivalent of that it's probably the the most uh most benevolent of the exactly. all the founder clan the, the, there's this drive that like they have to control all this medicine because that's what gives them the power but then also the people who perform the medicine are you know so benevolent and good-hearted that they can't turn a blind eye to the suffering that's in the forge so i i think that's a really interesting dynamic uh, we've i think we've talked about we could probably set this adventure in any part of the any faction anything like even like in the middle of all these and it would be interesting and that's that's what i love about this game so much um <laughs> so do you think again uh, three with a smattering of two absolutely okay the next one i have no strong thoughts on this one but artificial intelligence it's such a, it's a crud debate these days yeah. so to see it right here <laughs> I would imagine in such a society, though, they don't have a moral bias against uh, using AI in order to speed themselves forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, setting our opinions aside, um, they definitely wouldn't care. Um, anything that gets them more faster. What, what is that one? Do you think it's the, the second one? Um, there is AI technology, but it's, it's rare? Um, I think that is... See, the last one suggests that it's it's pretty much its own race of people, mm. and the second one, the the second one really makes it feel like you can only find it within the founder clans, 
in specific places, like with the elite, they get to use it. Yeah. Um, that way it doesn't have to be something you have to run into often, or you get to feel special mm. if you happen to get a ship that has one on there. I, I, I tend to agree here. I think that, um, you know, it fits in with what we're talking about in, in the, these resources exist, but they are rare and the people who control them have power. Um, and I think that, I think that probably the only thing that I'd want to talk about is like, how would we, how far do we want to go when we talk about AI in, in our, in our game? Are there kind of sentient robots and cyborgs that wander around that are artificially intelligent? Or are we talking about, it's a tool that's used in things. And it's also things like, um, you know, ships and things have their own kind of like motherboards or whatever that, that can kind of like guide and, and, and pilot things and do, do tasks like that. Um, it definitely feels like it depends upon if you're playing solo, mm -hmm. then the last option is a good one to have the ability to have a conversation with someone else without having to have crewmates. Yeah, definitely. Um, that is a, that's a big go-to if you just don't want to feel totally alone, but you don't want to, come up with another companion already yeah um just get told that you you know start leaving the hatch open by your ship's ai and there you go you've got your interaction to cover your session for the day yeah um i mean did you have a lean on on those or i, th I think i think I'm definitely going for the middle one with the the vestiges of advanced machine intelligence are coveted and wheeled by, wielded by those in power. But I think I, I'd want to make AI actually not that powerful in our game. It's kind of basic. Uh, it can do a lot of things, but it, it you know it can't. It's not capable of outwitting you know the average human. It's a it's a tool I think they use. It's helpful, but it's not replacing. Yeah. Um, the the genius of man. Yeah, and I, I think that that maybe if we talk about each of the clans controlling a different resource, I think maybe AI at the point at which the cataclysm happened and then the exodus followed, AI was probably not as developed as the other sciences and technologies, and as a result, it's only ever become you know a tool that's used, and it's not like a really powerful right. thing. Yeah, no, I can see that it's it's your your power or your position in, in the clan, if you're a member of one of them, is your own brilliance that you bring to the table. And if the only thing you can bring is a brilliant AI, then we'll take the AI and leave the guy out the border. <laughs> Absolutely. That is spot. <laughs> um, OK, well, here's an interesting one. The next one is war. Mm, we've said a lot. Um, in terms of resources seeming to be tight and dominated by one or the other, mm -hmm. as if they wouldn't want to waste them on trying to destroy each other. Um, and at the same time, they want to control each other. So, but I feel like, surprisingly, one, just because of the fact that they're they're trying to maintain what they have and the only resource they're really trying to fight to get from each other is knowledge mm. and if you destroy their entire hud hub then you've destroyed their archives all their backups this is something you need so why blow it up yeah and i think so that that first option is um here in the forge resources are too precious to support organized fighting forces or advanced weaponry I think that that actually that makes so much sense, and I think and I think this is really interesting to have a a a, a game that's that's driven by conflict. So we've got conflict between these these founder clans, but not driven by war, which is really interesting because it's it's kind of like a go to to you know people say conflict just put a war in because that's the easiest thing. There's there's sides you understand who wants what and it's simple, but a conflict between factions that don't want to destroy each other. <laughs> they want what the other has, but can't afford to get it. And, and they've got their resources are so tight because they're so invested in research development and advancing their technology and advancing the society that they just can't launch large scale wars. It's so interesting because, you know, 
drama without conflict isn't drama it's just some stuff that's happening right so that forces us as players to have to try and find a different conflict so like if there is no war where is our conflict between factions well it's about knowledge like you said like it's you know this is this is the perfect setting for a um a kind of like a clandestine kind of like spy kind of like cold yes. war type um and a, a completely different game to, to you know th either of the games that we played um and absolutely and you know just a really interesting thing so i, I yeah i really like that and i think this is interesting awesome. Because in my game, I was like, oh, I, I hate the idea that there's a war always raging. I then rolled up the one that says war never ends, right? So I had to stick <laughs> with it. And then I said I said in my session zero, right, I'm not doing a war story. And then within four episodes, Archer is pulled into this kind of like war, playing <laughs> all sides against each other. But anyway, that happened. So we're going to say... That, that, yeah, like weapons are simple and cheap. Starships are often cobbled together from salvage. Most communities rely on ragtag bands of poorly equipped conscripts or volunteers to defend their holdings and raiders prowl the forge in search of easy prey. Now, that, that again makes it feel like it's always a lawless place. I think those things are true on the fringes of society. And I think those things are, are you know, always dangers on the fringes. But like, uh, some raiders couldn't for instance cause the clans a lot of trouble but then the clans can't cause each other any trouble so there's there's just no dominant um military power in in our game and i think that's fascinating because they a it means that there's a power vacuum to be exploited but then b it also means like well who's got their finger on the trigger here do you know what i mean <laughs> right. I was thinking that, you know, with our characters, if there was something like not information brokers, but, you know, couriers that move this information between the founders, every time they leave one of these civilizations, they're in danger of these uh, individuals looking for easy prey. Mm. Um, so there's always a chance for some conflict. If you still want combat going on, there's always a chance because as soon as you leave, that's something that's waiting for you in the in the in between spaces. Mm. So you're always racing to the next outpost for safety, and then keep on going. So it you know it can make a difference when you're uh, doing your journeys just to decide. Okay, when I get to the next point, I've probably made it to some kind of small floating outpost. Yeah. No, I, li I like that a lot. So are, are you thinking along the lines of a courier for your character then, or, or is is that where you're kind of going with this? I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling like that. Like I just kind of dragged you into it. <laughs> mm. um, I'm, I'm feeling that um, maybe I've learned how to um, archive data um, and, you know, or encrypt it in such a way that, I'm pretty good at making sure it gets from one point to the other as long as I don't get blown out of space. Mm. Um, or that's the kind of career I'm trying to make for myself. Yeah. I'm an amateur here. <laughs> I, I wonder whether, so, you know, thinking about a character who's, who's driven by faith for me, but also really liking the idea of a kind of clandestine Cold War type adventure. I kind of wonder how easy it would be to have a game where you're a spy, but you're the player you're co-oping with. That's you. Doesn't know I'm a spy. That is as easy as just don't tell me in session one. I will. <laughs> don't tell you during world building. <laughs> I'm just going to squint at you like the whole time. Like uh, that looked a little sus, buddy. I don't know. Who are you working for? <laughs> but I wonder. I wonder whether, like, the, like it would be really interesting if both of our characters had like these ulterior motives we didn't know about, and you know, us just, you know, our jobs could just be moving information around between the clans, and you know, it's something that we're bored of doing, and it's something that you know we've done for a long time, but something changes. Uh, you know, we have to we have to take a position, and you know our commitment to securing information and and making things, you know, safe and transporting things is is you know suddenly not quite as straightforward as we thought. Um, I don't, I'm not hundred percent wedded on that, but I think that that was really interesting. 
Uh, cool. Right. Um, next truth is life form. So this is basically talking about how varied and kind of interesting life is in the galaxy. Now, Starforged doesn't actually let you, or there's no provisions for you to like make alien uh, um, uh, kind of characters, player characters. But there's plenty of scope to make kind of the weirdest monsters you can think of. And Lord knows, I have made enough weird monsters in my game. Um, <laughs> So how do you feel about this one? Because as soon as I scrolled down and saw that Life Forms was next, I was like, oh, this doesn't feel like this fits in our game because all of a sudden we've been talking about this, you know, very, you know, quote unquote, realistic kind of spy information, kind of like technology, science. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, we're talking about dreadful forge spawn, these aberrant creatures that are threatening to overrun life in the galaxy. How do you feel about this? Um... See, I was about to say that, you know, this is one of those moments where this is something they stumbled across, like overall, whatever life forms is here, whatever we roll is what's here. Um, and at the same time, you have a good point, you know, just like as if the forge spawn just kind of seemed left field mm. um, themselves. Now, I mean, the last one looks interesting. It's something they might want to reverse engineer. Like, how did you make life? Um, that actually might seem like that one weird dark spot of the uh, medical claim that we have, um, the medical faction that we have that, hold on, or the bioengineering that they want to reverse engineer what uh, the Essentia have done. So that that truth is life in the forge was seeded and engineered by the essentia ancient entities who enact their inscrutable will in this galaxy as soon as i looked at that i was like yeah that doesn't make any sense in ours but you have literally just said that there is a dark spot in the medical faction so what if what if that's our religion what if that medical faction has this kind of like elite group of scientists who are in the kind of biomedical engineering thing and they're trying that, to reverse engineer this stuff done by this this ancient entity called the Essentia. I think that makes the the yeah the medical uh, faction just you want to look at them as they're the they're the good guys of the story, but mm. everyone has a dark streak in them, and this is something you discover along the way. Yeah. Um, we, um, and they do really good to make you think that they're the good guys. And, and maybe that's why if, if you've got a lot of people who are in this medical faction who are, you know, turning away from the, the goal of this medical faction and trying to help other people kind of, like you say, benevolently, I wonder if that's why. I wonder if they discovered what's going on in this kind of weird, ah. super experimental thing. Oh, that's I think that's really good. Yes. Okay. So, like, do we end up with number three? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that um, it says it. You know, to, to just fill that out a little bit, it says the Essentia are architects of life within the Forge. These omniscient beings are rarely encountered and have powers and purpose beyond our comprehension. Some worship them. That makes perfect sense. Others resist or rebel against them. But trying to defy the will of the Essentia is like standing at the shore of an ocean to thwart the tide. They are inevitable. I think this is something that like is maybe like a myth but mm -hmm. the that like you say that that dark streak in the medical um faction they they don't think it's myth it's to them it's real and that's what they're trying they're trying to uncover that dreadful secret um and i wonder if that was yeah, no. tied to what went wrong in the cataclysm i wonder if that was what caused the sun plague because that's oh wow that seems really powerful doesn't it it, it is. It actually is. I hadn't even considered, oh, wow. Medical, you were my friend. You yeah. weren't supposed to bring the darkness. Interesting. We're getting to the end of it now. This is the this is the penultimate one. Um, and I, th I think this is where a lot of Starforge campaigns go in terms of like uncovering the general mystery to the world. And that's the truth about precursors. Now, we're talking about the civilizations that went in the forge before us and i've heard a lot of star forge campaigns and lord knows i've done it myself where like that's the big mystery at the center of the of the of the uh of, of the story like what is this society and what you know what did they do and what did they leave us and what messages were they trying to tell us um does that 
is there room for this in our story? And if there is, what of these three options fits the best? There's a large part of me that feels like it detracts from the what we have going on. It just if you fall into this, you would completely fall off the rails of everything else. You would get lost in here. Yeah. Um, that's I the agree. largest part of me. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's just the tiny part that's like, well, this could be part of the, you know, the gold rush, the just the try to get a hold of this technology to help advance your own. But the largest part feels like if you start falling into the precursors, it, it just pulls you out of everything else because this is its own. We all know it. I mean, my whole start of my game was about getting to a vault. Um, and that was it. Um, it can absorb your entire game and all this world building we've done it would have been a lot of time for as you said earlier you've spent like five hours developing a culture Mm -hmm. only to end up in a tavern talking to a goblin you've only just made a name for (laughs) yeah so so are we thinking that um the first option here, which is uh, um, over eons, a vast number of civilizations rose and fell within the forge. Today, the folk we call grubs, scavenger crews and audacious explorers delve into the mysterious monuments and ruins of those ancient beings. That is open enough that, yes, there was life here before. And yes, they may have left some interesting or even magical or mystical things here. But that's just not the focus of our story. Yep. I, I feel like that one is it. Um I feel like there's a me screaming in the back of my head that this is so different for me, but yeah. I like it. And um, yeah, no, I, I think that first one is it. Yeah. I mean, also like, I just like to say, this is the one I chose for my game and I've spent ages in precursor vaults <laughs> and using precursor technology <laughs> because I just kind of blended elements of the second one into it without really mm-hmm. thinking about it too much. So, you know, there is a lot of flex there, but I think, if we say we're going to start from a position of like, that's just not the focus of our story and that's just not what's going to drive a lot of what we're doing in the adventure. um, Then I think that's fine. I think you can just have that on the back burner. And then if something interesting presents itself, it's there and you can Mm -hmm. kind of go through it. And then, you know, you spend all our game, establishing that there are no such things as precursors and they didn't have this elaborate technology and they didn't have this kind of vast civilization then oh hang on what is it our our um characters have stumbled across a precursor vault well what does that mean for our world and that's you know that's interesting in itself but as we're starting out it's i, mm-hmm. I think out of all the stuff we've got it's probably the least interesting so lastly horrors now i always like this one because the scope for what you can do in it is is kind of cool like and i went full on horror i think for mine and, <laughs> you know I, i've engaged with it in my campaign quite a bit but then also there's been vast stretches where i haven't i did a halloween episode where one of my characters kicked the head off a zombie spaceman so um <laughs> that's you know a thing but like in our game does it make tonal sense to go full horror or leave it something that's unsaid um you know that's you you brought up a awesome point actually um being the very last option here uh which is like leaving off on a cliffhanger that sometimes you don't need to answer the question until it becomes relevant Mm. um I personally, when I did mine, I loved um, the, was it the White Dwarf Star? Um, I never got around to doing anything with it, Mm -hmm. but that's always my favorite. And I think if you're not trying to get involved in that yet, don't worry about it. Um, Because I don't actually have an opinion. Um, I'm bad at doing horror. Um, I end up joking too much and anything scary goes out the window. Yeah. Um, I also can scare myself, which is its own skill, everybody. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Unless you have a, a lean, I actually would have personally left it open um, and just fill it in when the opportunity, when an oracle says something creepy happened and say, you know what? Our horror is real. Mm. 
So, so do you think that that's the middle option, which is most insist that horrors aren't real, spacers know the truth? Or is it the first one that says, put enough alcohol in a spacer and they'll tell you the stories of ghost ships crewed by vengeful undead? It's nonsense. I think that, you know what, that's that's the perfect answer there is one, is you said for all of them, it's still the door is always open if you want to change it mm-hmm. and make them real. Yeah. Uh, you don't believe it in the beginning, but then you encounter it and now you're a believer. And I think as well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, if my character is driven by faith and or devotion, to have that faith shaken or challenged by supernatural entities would be interesting but like there's more things before that that can be conflict for my character if that's the route i'm going to go down oh you know what it actually made me think hold on we didn't do the bale fires did we we didn't know if we did do the bale fires then horrors make sense with bale fires when you were mentioning that there's steps before this undeath these are people who got caught in these weird reality rifts but not to get lost in that and staying on theme because the thing is as well you you've just mentioned there about bail fires and that is interesting even though we didn't pick the truth that specifically mentioned those maybe they can be like part of these stories that, that the spaces will tell you when you give them enough beer that there's a bale fire or there's like a stretch of like wild bale fire out in this sector beyond, you know, the last outpost for, you know, thousands of light years or whatever. And they swear that that's where like tales of these ghost crews come from. And you can still have that, even though you didn't pick it as a main element in the truths before, it's still an element that we can use um, as part of this and I think like if it's not your main focus it doesn't really matter because you've got you've just got an option there you've just got like a, a, a the, all, the all, all the bits you don't use you've still got the the box of bits that you can kind of forage around in and pull something out of you know yeah yeah no honestly I, I like that option it's just something in a, it's a nugget in the pocket I don't even know if that's a saying. I think I, it just made it. I think it, it. Well, if it's not a saying, it will be now. Uh, we've got, <laughs> we've got we've got a nugget in the pocket. So let's recap because that's the end of the truth exercise. We have got a advanced society, technologically advanced society, driven by science that were forced to leave the old galaxy because of a cataclysm um, caused by a sun plague, which was uh, the result of a scientific experiment gone awry. Um, our new forge is uh, populated by founder clans that are divided by their scientific expertise or their engineering expertise. Um, they are unable to effectively fight each other because they're so uh, set on determining uh, of preserving their knowledge and mm-hmm. um, keeping their you know their secrets. Um, there is black iron in our galaxy but we don't we don't know whose black iron is real um and iron sworn are either swearing their vows on an incredibly rare powerful metal or a fake (laughs) version of the same (laughs) thing and it's only powerful iron smiths that can tell the difference um much of our societies and our set uh civilizations and settlements are ruled over by um, you know strict laws and um, are quite structured, but then outside of those, it's a lawless frontier. Um, there is, uh, we said, there's no, go- there's uh, no god. There's just science. Um, yep. But uh, there are some faithful few who who do keep some kind of hope alive. Um, There are supernatural powers um, in the shape of paragons, but that is a result of genetic engineering by one of the founder clans. Um, Communication is instantaneous um, between everyone, except when the the factions and the clans are communicating with each other, when they send a telegram, (laughs) essentially. They send (laughs) couriers. Um, again, medicine is very advanced, but only one clan really controls it, but the, they have got, 
um, a weird experimental faction within the medical faction that is causing um, significant distrust of what they're doing and therefore like it's starting to splinter a little bit and it's quite unstable and people who are part of the medical faction are slowly trying to help the galaxy under their own skin um, mm-hmm. or off their own backs. Um, artificial intelligence is a thing but it's not hugely advanced um war is is just not a thing um but in the lawless frontiers there are plenty of roving raiders and you know trouble to be had but the clans and the factions these these founder clans are too set on preserving and furthering their knowledge to fight each other Um, and they're also acutely aware of the fact that they can't um fight each other because they don't want to destroy the knowledge that the other factions have um and then yes the the faction within the medical faction are trying to recreate the work done by the essentia the ancient entities who enact their inscrutable will in this galaxy that's really cool um we don't think there's a significant precursor civilization but you know there there are civilizations that existed before us um and if you put enough alcohol in a spacer, they will tell you stories of ghost ships crewed by vengeful undead, but it's nonsense. That's that's our truths, and that's a really interesting sandbox to play around in. It is. It is. I might end up taking it. <laughs> yeah. so I'm running sh- with it. Yeah. So, should we meet next week and start playing? Ah, uh, just tell me the time. I'll make the time. <laughs> so that was pretty cool right you can see how easily ideas can cascade um from a a series of very simple broad topics that you just generally are getting into and you can kind of really laser in on what's important to your game and your world whilst also having things that you're perhaps not so interested in vaguely fleshed out and, and kind of lurking to the side I really, really want to thank Sketchy for her time because um, it was a, a late one for both of us and uh, her patience as well because this took a long time to come out. We filmed this back in August or September, I think, um, but I just needed to kind of reach a, a natural break point in my campaign to put the video out. So Sketchy, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please like this video, subscribe if you've not done so already. Uh, These things really help me grow the channel and if you really want to support me in the work I do, then please do check out the Bad Spot Patreon. I'll be back next time, but until then, it is farewell and safe passage.